Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this very icy uh, Tuesday morning um, in January. Hope everyone uh, is safe uh, wherever you may be and uh, not out on the roads and all of that kind of stuff. Um, got a lot to cover, an absolute uh, uh, huge amount of, uh, of stuff to cover uh, this morning. Um, let's uh, actually start off with uh, prevention funding. We, um, I want to thank you all, first off, for those who um, uh, were able to uh, provide some feedback in, uh, on the uh, budget document uh, that, that, that we uh, put out. Uh, about a month, month and a half ago, um, and just uh, am so thankful uh, for all that, um, for all the uh, comments that we got. So thank you so much. Um, wanted to go into the the budget, how this is looking. Uh, we are going to push this. We're going to um, uh, have a combined document uh, with uh, some other state entity folks, uh, NAMI and uh, the Board Association and uh, the Ohio Behavioral Health care providers and um, all of those different folks, um, and then Mental Health America and, and some others. Um, but we're all coming together, hopefully going to be uh, submit, you know, uh, coming up with the same document, um, having many avenues that we'll be able to discuss this. Uh, however, we are going to have to take, uh, we as in uh, coalitions, um, us at the state level, uh, you with your local um, with your local legislator uh, have to be pushing prevention. Uh, it would be foolish to think that uh, someone else is going to do this work for us. Uh, and uh, and if we really want to be a uh, some you know if we really want funding, and I'm worried quite frankly uh, about federal funding. I don't know. I nobody knows anything. Um, we had a discussion yesterday uh, in a uh, in a statewide meeting about federal funding and the title of it was wild speculation because nobody knows what is going to be happening um, at this at this point with federal funding so but to go back so, so we really have to I think push for state funding at this point um, the, the fiscal year 1819 budget um, will have to be final by June 30th of 2017 uh, and Governor Kasich uh, has warned uh, there was a an article in the dispatch this weekend actually that a recession uh, is looming, and uh, that uh, tax receipts are down, and, and all of this uh, all of this stuff is happening, and uh, has actually asked for uh, budget submissions uh, at a hundred percent, so flat funding uh, of what was uh, asked for this budget cycle, and then also a ten percent cut. How would that look? Um, you know, some of the some of the uh, items mentioned in the article were uh, reentry programming. Uh, some suicide prevention uh, grant uh, pieces, uh, drug courts, uh, some things that, um, uh, you know, some of the newer things uh, that have been funded uh, recently. Uh, but, uh, you know, we don't, we don't know what that's going to look like. Um, so, you know, we are hopeful uh, that we at least get flat funding over the next couple of years. But uh, with uh, tax receipts being down and all of that kind of stuff, we, uh, we really don't know. So um, really want you to um, uh, be active in this uh, funding uh, conversation. Uh, when, when we come to, to SPECA, uh, really want you to, to uh, be an active participant in that. We really need everybody's ideas. We really need everybody's input and, uh, and actually output as well. Uh, to their legislators, uh, so that we are able to um, get the uh, prevention funding that that, that is needed. Um, go over quickly the uh, what we have, uh, what we uh, have put into the document with a lot of your help. Um, again, we're going to invest in community-based prevention services. Uh, the unified unified strategy around these uh, the SPF, the Strategic Prevention Framework, that is something that uh, you know, was uh, accepted far and wide and is something that is um, you know a, a good strategy moving forward we have you know many uh, folks have worked with the spiF understand it and uh, you know we need to continue that we need to to give uh, credence to the value of the SPF process uh, that we have in our communities, how we determine uh, what our prevention dollars are going toward and what our strategy is. Um, other things, you know, we're asking for a, a total investment of $12 million 
which would be about 68,000 on average, 68,000 per, per county for community-based prevention work. Um, uh, we are asking that uh, the, the prevention specialists be the ones that are uh, actually making uh, some of those uh, decisions in in uh, in, in communities, uh, so that uh, you know we aren't just doing um, we aren't just doing the uh, you know, car mock car crashes and things like that. We're actually doing things on a community-based uh, framework and uh, through the SWIFT process. Um, we also want to invest in school-based prevention services. Um, Ohio has nearly 3,600 public schools and um, uh, certified providers. You know, we work closely with uh, Lori Chris from the Ohio Council, who is a valuable resource. Uh, the Ohio Council of Behavioral Health Providers, um, and she says uh, their their certified providers estimate that it costs ten thousand dollars a year to have a certified prevention provider in a school building one day a week. Um, with all of the federal grants we currently get, local um, local monies that are, that is uh, that some communities get, uh, the, an additional state uh, to bring us up to that point would be an extra $22 million or $11 million annually from the state of Ohio. Currently, we don't get money. Uh, prevention is not uh, given money from the state of Ohio. We get uh, our money through a SAPT grant, um, uh, a federal SAPT grant, uh, Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Grant from SAMHSA. And uh, the state does uh, roll those monies out uh, to communities and to, to some statewide folks. Um, but for us to really be on par, or, or actually make some, you know, make, start to make a little bit of a dent, uh, we need additional funding from the state. And uh, actually, that 22 million, when you or 11 million annually, uh, just equates to six dollars and thirty-six six. $6.36 per student in public schools in Ohio. Uh, and, uh, you know, that when you, when you think of, you know, I've heard some numbers as high as $80 um, a student is what is really needed. You know, a $6.36 investment is uh, not that much and something that I, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, our legislators can pay attention to and, uh, and actually fund uh, this, uh, this budget cycle. We also want to require the use of trained and certified personnel. Um, ADAPO, uh, the PFS uh, grantees, uh, and, and uh, those doing those uh, grants um, are doing tremendous uh, work as far as training and certifying personnel. Our workforce is really extremely low in this state, and uh, we want to, to make sure that uh, the use of trained and certified personnel is something that is uh, actually uh, codified. Uh, something that we, that would be put into this budget bill, so that we aren't uh, doing uh, taking some strategies that don't have that are not evidence based or at least promising practices, and um, and and trying trying them in our communities. We can't just see what you know throw something against a wall and see what sticks. We instead need, uh, you, know, you wouldn't go to a car mechanic if you were wanting to have heart surgery. The same thing as uh, with, with prevent, prevention personnel is you want someone who is actually trained in it, who actually knows what they're doing so that uh, we can get the most bang for our buck in our communities. Um, so we really want to push that. And then also, we need to rely on research to inform our prevention service delivery. Right now at the State House, we have a very, very, um, uh, we have a tough time. Uh, where we are, there's a lot of bills going through. The MBR was, uh, you know, had a lot of policy pieces, but a lot of it is, um, it's, uh, a lot of it uh, is just something that, well, we've heard this from, from someone, it's more anecdotal. Well, we need more research to inform our prevention service delivery. We actually need data in our communities. Uh, we need to be using, whether it is the YRBS or whether it is Oh Yes Survey or whatever uh, other uh, survey that you're using, how is it working with young people? Um, you know, we, we've got to make sure that we aren't using scare tactics uh, in, in our communities as well. Um, and that we continue to use uh, evidence-based and promising practices, which are based upon data, which is, are based upon um, uh, you know, situations that, um, you know, that, that has something to show, yes, this really does work. Yes, this really can make a difference. We really need to make sure that, uh, that we base all of our decisions on that. So that's a really quick overview about what we're going with as far as funding. 
and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Uh, you know, the, the budget uh, probably won't be probably won't be revealed until early to mid February. So with us doing um, you know, some of this work beforehand, we will have plenty of time to talk to our legislators, to work with uh, our elected officials, to try to get prevention. Um, and if we're all speaking from the same voice and they hear this over and over and over, perhaps they can buy into this and uh, provide some, uh, you know, provide funding for uh, the vital prevention services that are needed, um, especially uh, with the opiate issue that we have uh, in the state. So going on to medical marijuana, um, in one way we're trying to, uh, in one way we're trying to prevent uh, the, the use of drugs, or the other, uh, it seems like we're uh, we're um, allowing a new drug to be out there. And yes, it's for medical purposes, but we've talked long and hard about all of the issues that are that that, that has happened in Colorado and California and Washington, all of these different states that already have medical marijuana uh, facilities. Um, we are going through the rule, rule process. They really do need to hear from you. Last last month we got 75 comments. Almost all of them were pro pot. There were some that were uh, you know that were that were taking more of a public health approach, but you know most of them were pushing. Yes, we need more cultivators. Yes, we need more grow space. Yes, we need to grow more marijuana. All, uh, a very very business oriented. We really do need to hear um, from uh, public health officials whether it's your prevention coalition, whether it's someone on your coalition, if you're contacting your hospital or your school, someone there, um, we really do need to hear from you. So right now, uh, the physicians and the dispensary rules are up for debate. Um, the physician's rules basically uh, would allow a licensed medical doctor or a, a DO uh, to recommend. There are no prescriptions for marijuana, as, uh, as you know. Um, so they would be allowed to recommend. Um, there would only be a two-hour uh, continuing, continuing medical education course required to recommend. Um, and uh, recommending physicians cannot own or invest any medical marijuana entity. So they can't be a doctor and then send you to a dispensary or a grow house um, the, 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 that they own. Um, they would also have to get this license uh, um, to recommend medical marijuana renewed every two years, just like their medical license. Um, and then they have to have a what's called a bona fide physician-patient relationship, which means you have to have had some kind of uh, uh, past uh, past. Um, medical history with these docs, and then also a continuing plan uh, for whatever uh, condition you, you might have. Um, other rules that we are, uh, that, that are in these sets of uh, rules are uh, you have to develop a treatment plan for the issue, not a treatment plan as, as far as probably what we think, a drug treatment plan, but an actual treatment plan for whatever ails you. Uh, so if you have a bad back, it can't just be you know, medical marijuana, there has to be some kind of treatment plan um, in place, whether that means physical therapy, or does that mean uh, some other kind of exercises or, or um, uh, solutions to this problem. Um, yet there also, the physicians would be allowed to determine whether the patient needs a caregiver. Um, and if needed, a physician shall document the name of the caregiver um, in, in the file. And a patient can only be recommended every 90 days. So a person cannot, and this, is, this will be done through ORS, the, uh, basically the prescription dr uh, drug database. Uh, so a, pa a patient cannot go to one doctor, get a recommendation for 90 days, and then uh, you know, a month and a half later go to another doc and get another 90-day recommendation. They can only have one recommendation every 90 days. Um, the state medical board will also consider other conditions or diseases annually to be added to the list of conditions. So if uh, you know, there seems to be someone's says that uh, the flu, uh, or you know, a good case, uh, the former presidential candidate Gary Johnson, Gary Johnson, who owned a medical mar or yeah, owned a medical marijuana facility, um, interestingly enough, actually was pushing that Ebola was um, a a recommended um, a, a recommended treatment source would be marijuana for Ebola. You know, none of, none of it was uh, fact based, but uh, that didn't 
that didn't stop him from saying it. Um, some recommended rule changes. This is Drug Free Action Alliance recommended rule changes, and this is something that um, uh, we have on our, on our website. Um, and I believe Brittany's gonna have a um, um, have a newsletter uh, that, that she'll send out uh, with these types with these documents, so that uh, can can uh, include some of the rules um, and also some of the rule changes that we're looking for. Instead of just a, a two-hour CME training, uh, continuing magic, medical education, um, we we would like an eight-hour training that would include um, some addiction training. Um, right now, doctors are not uh, doctors are not trained, uh, you know, really well for addiction issues um, in our state. There's not a big requirement for that. Um, also, what are the mental and physical health risks? There is no uh, there is no documentation. There is no rule that says that you know what this training has to look like. Um, it's going to be devised by the uh, the state medical board. But we think that it has, should include everything and not just be something that is pro-marijuana as well. Uh, we'd also like to see the physicians uh, recommend a dosage and the strength to be provided. Uh, like any other medicine, if you go to a pharmacy and, or if even if you get over-the-counter medication, there are, there's directions where you, okay, I take two teaspoons of this cough medicine and every, every four hours. This is basically based on patient need. So whatever the patient decides they want, the strength that they want, the, the amount, this is something that um, we really feel could, could be a, uh, uh, could, could really be uh, an avenue for diversion and uh, an overuse and addiction. So this is something that um, we want to make sure is in there. Uh, pregnant women. Uh, there's a lot of re supposed research, a lot of actual things on Twitter and and uh, Facebook from the pro marijuana camp that says that pregnant women should take medical marijuana. We know that's not good for the for the uh, fetus, um, for the the child that's growing inside uh, the the lady's body. Um, but they, you know, their their two big pieces are if you smoke marijuana, you'll have higher birth weight for the baby, um, which has not been proven by, by the way, um, and it will help cure uh, morning sickness, um, which is, uh, again, not proven as far as data, but uh, they do have some uh, anecdotal stories. We want to make sure that pregnant women uh, cannot receive this and that uh, folks are, uh, you know, that the child actually, you know, just like Tobacco smoke, or uh, you know, those are not recommended as uh, as well. Um, tobacco and alcohol. So let's go on to the medical marijuana rules for dispensaries. Uh, right now, the 40 dispensaries would be in Ohio. 40 medical marijuana dispensaries. They're pushing extremely hard the, to grow this. They say this, these are not enough dispensaries in the state. Um, the dispensary must have a clinical director on premises at all times. Um, and a clinical director, basically there are three categories of employees at a, uh, at a dispensary. One's a clinical director, which has to be a licensed pharmacist, a licensed physician, a clinical nurse specialist, or a physician's assistant. Those have to be your clinical directors. There's also what's called a dispensary key employee which is someone that uh, accepts the product. They're able to go into a special room and see uh, databases and all of this, this other kind of stuff. And then there's the, the dispensary employee, which is more like the bud tenders, the, the, uh, the checkout people, and those types of things. Um, there has to be a clinical director on premises. Uh, we don't think that's going to make it through because we don't know how many uh, pharmacists or physicians are actually going to want to quit their practice and become a medical marijuana dispensary clinical director. Um, also, they can dispense a 90-day supply. Again, we don't know what a 90-day supply is. It is not determined by physicians. Um, it is determined by patient uh, need. And right now, there's not even a, um, there's not even limitations on how much a, a patient can act, ask for. If you think that, uh, you know, a 90-day supply and you need, you know, 500 gummy bears to get you through 90 days, um, you know, that's a lot of uh, product that could be out there for diversion. Uh, again, it's, this is not smoked product. It's not uh, uh, anything like that. It is all uh, vaporized or actual edible, uh, edible product. Uh, dispensary employees shall receive a minimum of eight hours training, uh, which would include what kind of uh, strains are best for what ailment and those types of things. 
Uh, no delivery services available. This is one we are going to have to push extremely hard because the pro marijuana folks want delivery system. If, if you do nothing else uh, after hearing this except go into the the uh, rules, make public comment that you can't have, you know, we shouldn't have delivery services available. Somebody asked me yesterday, what is delivery services? Delivery service is the, the same as if you call Domino's Pizza. They will come and bring your pizza to the door. They, these people will come and bring your pot to the door. So you know, this is something that we are really, really um, uh, strongly against. Um, and uh, the pro pot folks are, are really, really trying to push this through. This is the one thing out of everything else um, that, that they want to have happen, that we have delivery services. Um, and then also no one is allowed in the dispensary without a patient or employee ID card. Within the dispensary rules, there are also a lot of advertising rules. Um, as the, those are there in front of you. Logos, signs, and advertisers must be approved by the Ohio State Board of Pharmacy. Uh, no cartoon characters, no fictional characters, no pop culture icons. Um, uh, you know, this is popular in other states. No merchandise sold to anyone under the age of 18. Uh, you can have a website, so any dispensary could have a website, but you have to have one of those age affirmation requirements, uh, which is basically what year were you born, and anybody with half a brain can uh, determine, okay, I'm over 18, so 18 years ago was 1998, so if I put my birth year as 1997, I'm good to go. Uh, no brand names uh, are allowed to be used. Uh, dispensary signs cannot be larger than 16 inches by 18 inches. These are the signs that hang in the window that, that, that um, uh, tell what store you're at. And uh, you can't have neon signs or illuminated signs. You also can't have a product in, a, in the window or any kind of billboards. So those are the uh, more of the uh, advertising rules. There was also just a strange piece of language. I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, that uh, it says the State Board of Pharmacy may revoke, suspend, limit, place on probation, or refuse to grant or renew a dispensary license, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Um, if the board finds that the license has violated any state or federal, federal law or rule, regardless of jurisdiction in which acts were committed, except for minor traffic violations. This is a strange rule because literally having a dispensary breaks federal law. So right there in that section of rule, it says that federal law, even though we know we're breaking federal law, that the Board of Pharmacy actually could go down and shut you down just for that. Um, it is, it is a, a strange piece, um, and, and I've asked uh, some of the folks uh, who are in charge of this, and uh, they did not catch that. So uh, we, we might see a change on that, but um, right now, basically, if the Board of Pharmacy wants to go and uh, day one when they set up, they can shut it down for that piece, you know, for that uh, part of the rule that is in that is in play there. Some of the dispensary fees, um, there's an application fee of $5,000. That doesn't mean you're getting chosen. That just means that uh, you have to apply. You have a $5,000 fee. Um, when you get it, you have to uh, have a you have to pay an $80,000 fee. Um, when once you get the license, and then if you uh, have a uh, renewal and you don't pay it on time, there's a $10,000 late penalty. Um, the dispensary key employee, which are the more important, I guess, uh, in their mind, more um, the, the employees with more responsibilities at the stores, uh, at these dispensaries, um, they have a $250 fee that they have to pay for their card. Uh, dispensary employee application fee is 100 bucks. Um, and then uh, if you lose your card, it's 50 bucks. And for every ad that, um, the, uh, the, the, the dispensary wants to run, you actually have to pay the state of Ohio a $100 fee just to, um, just to look at it. So even if they don't approve it, you still have that $100 fee that you have to pay. So um, I don't know how, quite frankly, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Board of Pharmacy is going to, uh, is going to do these advertising, um, make determinations. I don't know if they have the staff to do that. So I don't know what kind of turnaround you're going to get on that as well. Um, the recommended rule changes, again, 
no home delivery. Um, if this is going to be medicine, let's make it medicine. There's already going to be caregiver rules, which means that if, if the person is homebound or whatever, there are going to be other people that will be able to act in their names to, uh, to get the medication, you know, to get the marijuana, I shouldn't say medication, uh, to get the marijuana. And uh, to have it home delivered is just a, uh, it's a problem and, and all kinds of different ways. Um, we're asking that the main we we maintain the fee schedule. Uh, the industry is also uh, is also pushing that uh, we want to lower those fees. Of course, they don't want to pay all those fees. Um, they want to make as much profit as possible. Um, we want to make sure that it references only marijuana, that you don't use Mary Jane's elixir or you know reefer something or other. Um, uh, we want to make sure that there are no coupons, discount programs, or clubs. Like if you go to Kroger, you go to any other kind of uh, you know, grocery store, there, there seems to be a ton of these little clubs now. We have little, little, your little card, the more you buy, you get discounts and all of those types of things. Um, and there's already in law that indigent folks and veterans um, actually have discount programs available. Um, so we don't want this to be something where it's a bunch of coupons and, and people get low-cost weed and, and all of that. Um, no broadcast ads. Um, we really want a 90-day supply for each condition to find uh, right now. Uh, we, you know, with patient determination, again, if I pull up my truck and I say, you know, fill me up, baby, um, you know, that, there's nothing against the law that says that that doesn't, you know, that, that is illegal. Um, ads should not be placed on vehicles. Again, these are our recommend, uh, recommendations we're going to put in. Um, ads should not be placed on vehicles, clothing, or handheld signs, you know, those signs that they throw up in the air, um, and then no marijuana leafs in advertisements. If you want to make any kind of public comment, go to medicalmarijuana.ohio.gov, and there is a section. There's a little thing right above, uh, right in the toolbar that says rules, and that is exactly where you need to enter your public comments. I'm begging and urging you to, to your coalition folks, uh, you to, to make some kind of public comments so that we can, uh, because frankly, the, the comments that were taken last time, they actually used, and uh, there were some cultivation uh, rules that were changed. Uh, cultivation, uh, cultivation uh, they doubled those, um, which they really wanted. They also increased the square footage of, of the cultivation uh, properties, um, and that was all based on public comments. So we really need to be uh, diligent. We really need to be strong and, and vocal in our opinions on these types of things to protect public health. And finally, we get to the uh, 21st Century C uh, Cures Act. Some of you may have been on the webinar that uh, Director Plowk had um, a few days ago. Um, I think it was Friday. And basically what has happened is uh, the feds, uh, uh, President Obama signed a um, signed a bill called the uh, 21st Century Cures Act, and basically it's it's a it's a, a whole bunch of things shoved into this bill, and there's actually uh, some money in it for the opioid crisis. It's called the opioid crisis grant. Um, right now, um, the department is coming up with uh, with some ideas on how to submit. They have to submit a plan to SAMHSA by February 17th of 2017. Um, this is a two-year award. Um, Ohio will get $26 million for, uh, for two years. However, it is a renewal grant, so if the uh, new administration wants to come in and cut that, um, there might not be that second year. Um, and we don't know, again, wild speculation, we don't know how anything is going to be handled by this new administration. It's not been really uh, transparent on, what, on what's going to happen. Um, the purpose of this grant is to increase access to treatment, uh, supplement activities are already underway, and su support a comprehensive approach. Um, they have, uh, the department would like to set aside $4.9 million per year for prevention activities, um, and uh, some needs assessment are going to be needed, are going to be determined by the department, areas where opioid uh, crisis is most prevalent, where uh, treatment providers are in the state, where they're needed, existing activities, um, all of those types of things. Um, and some of the areas of focus that, that SAMHSA is actually 
uh, given uh, our, uh, for this grant our medication assisted treatment prevention expert recovery supports uh, workforce development and secondary trauma among first responders um, we, we really uh, right now they're not taking uh, any uh, appointments uh, Director Plowick said uh, that uh, they, they have such a short window to actually uh, get this grant submission in, that they're not taking any kind of appointments or anything. Um, however, uh, I do want you to be aware of this, um, that this should be coming down the pike, and that if there are uh, you know, discussion ideas, uh, I think it's something that uh, we need to uh, talk about as a group of prevention professionals. This is a great uh, opportunity, I think, for uh, Speca to be at the uh, at the forefront about what is going on uh, with prevention dollars, uh, how coalitions can be helpful in, in, in all of this, um, and this is uh, you know, money that uh, is new money, and uh, yes, it is time limited, but uh, again, it can help with some of the uh, existing uh, existing activities that we already have in our state. So this is what I know uh, for this uh, for this week. I know I went a minute over already, um, but uh, if you have any questions, um, I would love to hear those. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, for anyone who does have questions for Tony, of course, he can be reached at tcoder at drugreactionalliance.org. Um, this is Brittany Sandage, uh, Director of Coalition Programs, for those of you new to the call today. Um, Tony had mentioned previously that we do have an upcoming SPECA meeting. That is next week. That is January 17th. We know that Ohio weather can be unpredictable and treacherous, but we hope to see many of you there. Um, in addition, some of the comments that you experienced today, some of the outlined is recommendations, the language that Tony has gone over, that will be placed in the SPECA newsletter that's going out today so that it is very fresh in your mind and you'll be able to use that as you need um, in emailing your comments. Um, we did have a question, Tony, from Sheila. Um, with reference to expiration dates on some of the products that will be available, has there been conversation about what happens when those products expire? What are we doing to prevent diversion? What, what might we do to dispose of them? There is a year um, expiration date on all products. It has to be a year that they're actually processed um, in the facilities. And they're still coming up with ways on how to dispose of those products. Um, you know, with, with some of, with most of it not being any kind of plant matter, uh, it's going to have to. I, I don't I know. There's been talk about well, do we put them in landfills? Do we do you know put them in different containers? All of this kind of stuff. Um, and right now, uh, that's still being determined. Uh, it's a great question though, and uh, something that they are considering at the state level. Uh, but uh, there is no knowledge about how that's going to be done. And I'll, uh, just to also, I forgot to mention, all public comments actually have to be done by Friday, Friday at 5 o'clock, because our next meeting is January 27th, and they need to make those changes in the rules, in the next set of rules, so that they can get the public comments um, enacted and put into those rules. So we really do need to hear you from you by Friday. Thank you very much, Tony, um, and thank you all for participating and joining us today. Um, at this point, I believe we've addressed most of the questions that are coming in. Um, actually, I just got one, so get ready, Tony. <laughs> one additional question. What is the status of the Attorney General's Prevention Curriculum Committee? Can you speak to that? Um, they are still determining what the, you know, with all of the testimony they heard that um, uh, the Amy O'Grady and the Attorney General's office is still coming up with, you know, what are those final outcomes? What are those final uh, conclusions that they're coming by? Uh, that should be done. Uh, I know that some of, of the meetings, the get-togethers, have been canceled. So I think it's relatively close about what their recommendations are uh, for uh, from that that, that come that have come from that committee. So uh, I would guess in the next month that you will hear something about the. Uh, uh, about what that committee has come up with and, uh, and and to share with the state of Ohio. We had a question from Andrea, thank you very much, um, concerning the 21st Century Cures Act. With relationship to the $4.9 million that's allocated for prevention, um, do we know anything about what that process will be to distribute and allocate the funds? Will it be available at the community level to coalitions? Do we know? 
We really, we really don't know um, what their uh, plan is going to be. Uh, obviously, we're going to push, uh, and I think that it is the department's uh, hope that uh, most of that money is spent at the local level. I know that the grant, um, Director Plauk said that 5% uh, uh, would be allowed to be used on admin, and she said they don't want that. They don't want to come anywhere close to that amount. So it's not going to take the 5% at all. So I think the more money that goes out to actual providers, to uh, those who, are, uh, who, who can use the money for actually action-based and, uh, and um, you know, evidence-based uh, projects that you're working on, um, I think that is her intention. Um, I think on the OMAS website is actually the, um, it's actually the, uh, the, the webinar that she gave us the other day it was it was um, uh, not you know incredibly informative um, other than what the grant says um, you know again they're trying to come up with a plan for the state of Ohio um, so it is you know and they were looking for uh, some feedback and those and, and that type of stuff but um but I think uh, I would uh, and knowing Tracy as well um, I could wager that a lot of that money is going straight to uh, uh, communities and actual work being done um, she really didn't want it uh, on admin and all of those uh, things that seem to uh, eat up money sometimes she wants it out there doing work making the difference uh, that we know that you all make out there Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we always try to be very mindful of your time, but when good questions come in, we'll go seven minutes over. So thank you for, for hanging in and for doing the work that you're doing on the ground. Um, as Tony said, we're going to keep diving into these issues as best we can and keep you as updated as possible. Um, after this webinar, just a bit of housekeeping, you will get the follow-up email that contains your RCH certificate as well as a link to where you can find more information on the marijuana and some additional information. So if you ever need anything, you know how to find us. Again, thank you very much on behalf of all of us here at Drug Free Action Alliance, and have a wonderful week.